And this is a follow-up to last week. Um, I hope I made a compelling argument for the truth of a pre-tribulation rapture. And yeah, I, I tried to be as thorough as I could. I firmly believe that. There is debate, and I am open to that. Uh, if people disagree, you're welcome to disagree. I believe that is the truth. And so that's what I teach. There is one big key I left out of that whole teaching, though, and that's the imminence of the rapture. It can literally happen at any time. It's really amazing, actually, when you look at it. Uh, I love prophecy. I think you all know that. And I spend a lot of my time, I've spent a lot of my time over the past 10 years really digging into the prophetic word, particularly prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled and really trying to hone my interpretation so that it's accurate. I mean, I, I'm vain, I like to get things right. <laughs> I'm not gonna say something that I'm not at least 99% confident that I'm giving you the truth. I do leave out that 1% that, hey, it hasn't happened yet, and until it happens, I can't guarantee that my interpretation is 100% correct. And anybody, if you, any teacher on YouTube, any, pro pastor, whatever, if they say this prophecy that hasn't happened yet, this is exactly what's going to happen, I won't take any argument or debate, be very skeptical. <laughs> because when you think you're not wrong, that's when you're wrong. I just want to throw that out there. So again, I, I believe the pre-tribulation rapture is sound doctrine. There's a possibility it's not, but the imminence of the rapture cannot be debated. That it can literally happen at any time. And what's really cool about this, compared to all the other um, biblical pro prophecy, is there is no predicate to this prophetic event on God's calendar. Every other prophecy in the Bible, both those that have happened and those that are yet to happen, have certain conditions that have to be met for that prophecy to be fulfilled. Um, we just got done in the discipleship class studying Isaiah. Give you a I, I love this prophecy, but a great example is the one of Cyrus. You know, it was written 200 years before the Babylonian exile. The, and a very, very detailed prophecy. But you think about it, when it was written by Isaiah, when I, Isaiah put that in his scroll, there was a very simple predicate that had to be met. The Jews had to be in Babylon. <laughs> At the time it was written, there was a temple, there was a Jerusalem, there were Jews occupying that land. As long as they were in the land worshiping at the temple, that prophecy could not be fulfilled. And the same is true with every other prophecy. There are certain conditions, certain nations have to align, a certain nation has to exist, certain nations have to come against Israel, Israel has to be in disobedience. With the rapture, none of that is true. There is nothing that has to occur for the rapture to take place. Now, that said, I believe, and I hope you're in agreement with me, that the tribulation cannot start until the rapture takes place. But that doesn't mean that the rapture, or that the tribulation begins the day the rapture happens. In fact, I personally believe that there's gonna be about a six month break between the rapture and when the Antichrist is revealed by the breaking of the first seal. A lot of that's based on some Old, text or Old Testament typologies. Not gonna go into it, don't have time. But whether it's six months, six weeks, six years, irrelevant. The rapture can happen and then the tribulation will take place at some future date. And this has been true since basically 11 days after Jesus ascended to heaven when the Holy Spirit came down 10 days after he ascended on Pentecost. The very next day, Peter said, or actually that morning he was out preaching, but the church basically started the next day for all intents and purposes. From that point till today, the rapture could have taken place at any point. Paul absolutely believed that in his lifetime, the rapture would take place. You see that over and over in his epistles to the Thessalonians, the Corinthians, etc. It's obvious he had that expectation. He was wrong, but he was right to think that because it is sound that there's nothing to predicate that the rapture occurs. And every generation from Paul till today has reasonably believed that the rapture could happen in their lifetime, and they were 100% right to believe that. The 
biggest difference between all those generations preceding and where we are now is a lot of really miraculous stuff would have had to happen for what's depicted in Revelation to come to fruition. Um, now, it, it could have been that when you know, Paul and his generation was raptured and we just waited 2,000 years without a church for events to be lined up for the tribulation to occur. Thankfully, God has grace and didn't work it that way. Um, but, oh, lost my train of thought, my apologies. <laughs> The point is that the rapture can occur at any time. But as we get closer to things lining up, you can rest assured that the rapture is getting closer to actually occurring. The fewer, two things I want to say on this. L let me start with this. The key to interpreting biblical prophecy properly is to recognize one simple fact. Prophecy is history written in advance, period. In, for, remember, God created everything, space, matter, and time. He exists outside of time. So for him, everything that in the, is in this book is history. It has already happened. And he is a wonderful historian. He doesn't embellish. He gives great detail, and every single detail he provides happens exactly as he describes it. Now, there are aspects that he doesn't include is from his perspective. It's not relevant. It's not important. He gives us what's important, but what he gives us absolutely happens. You see it in the histories, and you see it in the prophecies that have been fulfilled, and you will see it in the prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled. Our difficulty is we exist in time, and time is linear, and all we know for certain is what has already passed. Actually, even in this moment, it has already passed as I'm speaking it. Kind of, the moment occurs, takes a few milliseconds for our brain to process, the IE, it has already happened as the next event is happening. We are always in the past and looking back. We cannot know for certain what the future will bring. The only one who does is God. And he tells us very, and that's the beauty. One of the reasons I really love prophecy is because of that. He did not have to give us this gift, but it is a gift. If for no other reason, even if we completely bungle it and misinterpret the prophecies 100%, just totally get it wrong. I mean, the Pharisees and Sadducees did. We might too. But it proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is in firm control. This is his creation. He knows exactly what's going to happen. And he has assured us that the outcome is good better than anything we can actually possibly comprehend. And we have that assurance through prophecy. It's amazing. The other aspect of this, um, again, prophet, interpreting prophecy is difficult because, again, we're in a linear timeline. We're, we're subject to time, and we really can't know for sure how the events that are depicted are exactly going to work out. We will we will always be surprised. I, I firmly believe that when, Dan, when Cyrus walked into the palace and Daniel brought him the scroll, he was a little surprised that Cyrus was actually walking into the palace. He knew the prophecy. He knew it well enough to be able to show Cyrus that the prophecy, his name was written by Isaiah 200 years before. But I really don't think he knew exactly how that would happen. And it was a little shocking to him when it occurred. And then, to, but he... He believed it, and he took it to Cyrus, and by golly, everything that Isaiah wrote happened exactly as Isaiah wrote it. God is good. Um, as we study prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled, it's important to look at the details and to be exact and, direct, and to not twist scripture to match what is happening in your current environment. It's absolutely, look around at the world, see what is happening. But do not assume that because you want 
the end to be now, or things are really bad and it feels like this should be the end, if it doesn't match what scripture says, then it's not the end. If you, cannot, if you have to make a leap of logic to say this detail, that detail, for example, the um, two witnesses being resurrected at the midpoint of the tribulation, seen by every person around the world, if you can't envision how that might happen, then guess what? The, tribulation, the midpoint of the tribulation isn't about to happen. It might, but it would take a miracle to get there. 40 years ago, eh, you could kind of see it, but I mean, broadcast, live broadcast TV wasn't ubiquitous. Not everybody in every portion of the world had a television. 100 years ago, forget about it. Not going to happen. Now, yeah, I can kind of see how that might happen. Most everyone has a cell phone, space link is up, most everyone has connection to the internet, and where it may not be ubiquitous yet, we can absolutely see how that might be the case in a couple of years. Detail after detail after detail that I look at prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled, I don't have to make as many leaps to see those happening as I did 40 years ago. And kind of like that saying that I'm fond of saying, is when you see the Christmas decorations go up, you know Thanksgiving is right around the corner. <laughs> and when I see these, these things starting, to, when uh, world events converge to match what God describes in the Bible, I start to pick my, perk my ears up and go, maybe, maybe we're right there. I could be wrong. And I'm totally open to that. Again, I hope I'm not, but there's a, there's a possibility. I'm not, the purpose of this message this morning is not to give you a comprehensive argument as to why I think we're in the end times. I do believe it, but at the end of the day, it's really not that important. Decide for yourself. Study Revelation. If you have any interest at all of knowing where we are, study Revelation, study Daniel, study all the prophets, actually. Pay particular attention to Daniel, pay attention to Zechariah, read the um, Synoptic Gospels, paying a particular attention to the, all of the discourse in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You know, read the epistles, particularly from Peter, the um, first and second Timothy, um, Jude. The, all of these will give you details and things that will occur either immediately prior or during the tribulation, and then you can get a good feel for what that period will look like. And then, if you look around and the world starts to look like that, maybe, maybe. I will give you just an example, one puzzle piece, just so you can have an idea of where I'm coming from, get an idea of how I look at the scripture and how I interpret it, and maybe that can help you if you decide this is a study that might be of interest to you. Um, and I'm going to go to the Olivet Discourse. It's uh, really great, and it comes from Jesus, so there's really not a better source. Um, Pastor taught a couple weeks ago, um, started, and the, if you have your Bibles, um, please open to Matthew 24. Um, he started with the beginning. I'm actually going to go to the end. Um, and I'm going to go, uh, starting in verse 32, I need glasses. Um, starting with the parable of the fig tree. And I'm just going to read it through, and then I'll give a little exegesis on this. But Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near, at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. So start at the beginning of that. Jesus says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. Key, it's a parable. 
it's a, an analogy, it's figurative language. And the Jews would have recognized that immediately. And this also leads into the difficulty. Just like I said last week, you don't want to base your entire theology on a parable, like the parable of the 10 brides, because, or bridesmaids, because parables are very, very difficult to interpret. I mean, even the apostles were constantly asking Jesus, uh, what did that parable mean? And they were with him. So from our perspective, it can be trying to get the accurate interpretation of a parable. However, that said, he said, let me actually back up a little bit. What I mentioned last week, the Synoptic Gospels, you have Matthew and Mark written to an audience of the Jews, Luke written to an audience of the Gentiles. If you notice, when you look at the Olivet Discourse in those three Gospels, the parable of the fig tree is not in Luke. That's because it's not applicable. The Gentile would not understand the parable that Jesus is giving. The Jew would. And really it goes back to symbology of the people. If you look at any people group, any nation, uh, it's really comprised of three components. You've got the p politic, you have the culture, and you have the religion. Those three basically define a people group within a specific region. And the same is true of the Jew, and they are symbolized by fruit. Um, you have the olive, the grape, and the fig. The olive represents the, poli the political side, the, the, the um, grape is the culture, and the fig is the religion. And so all combined, those three represent the Jews in Israel. So when Jesus says to a Jewish audience, now learn this parable from the fig tree, they would recognize that he's talking about Israel. And Israel, in a time when it is new, it is rebirthed, it has just put forth its um, fresh leaves at the beginning of summer before the fruit is born. So you also, when you see all these things, all these things that Jesus has talked about in the Olivet Discourse, all these calamities and all these things that lead up to the tribulation and through the tribulation, when you see all these things, know that my return is near. He's not talking about the rapture. He's talking about his second coming when his feet set down on Mount Zion at the end of the tribulation, that seven-year period. When you see all these things, know that the end is near. And assuredly, I say to you that this generation will not pass until all these things come to be. He's not talking to the generation of the apostles. He's talking to the generation that will arise, the generation that will see all the things leading up to and through the tribulation. And I firmly, because he's talking about a fig tree, I firmly believe this is the nation of Israel, reborn in one day on May 16th, 1948, to fulfill Isaiah's prophecy. Um, so the next question is, how do we define a generation? That's where it gets tricky. Um, a lot of people, for because of Exodus, thought that a generation was 40 years. I lean toward it being 80 years based on Psalm 91. Um, read it, it's great. Um, it, it defines it as 70 years or 80 years if by, um, the Hebrew word actually means if you're stubborn or stiff-necked, which the Jews are. God says that many, many times. So basically, I expect that the generation is 80 years. There are other arguments that a generation is 100 years, and they're fairly compelling as well. Either way, if my interpretation of this parable is accurate, then we're in that time period, and we're getting real close to 80 years, and he says all these things. So it's not just the opening of the first seal. It's the opening of all seven seals, all seven bowls, all seven trumpets. It's the whole kit and caboodle. That whole seven years has to fit within that generation. We're getting mighty close. That's not all, though. And I, I read beyond that because I think this is really, really key, is now in the days, uh, as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And he gives a description. He gives that example. They were eating and drinking and marrying, but was that really all they were doing? What? Sorry. Let me go back to Genesis really quick. Genesis 6. Um, let's start at verse 5. 
Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. That verse is the... It's a tie, actually. That, that pains me almost as much as when Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Those two are just... Oh, absolutely kills me. Man was so wicked in the days of Noah that God was sorry he made us. And Jesus says, that's how it's going to be at the beginning of the tribulation. To follow up on that, I want to turn to what Paul has to say um, in his letter, his second letter to Timothy uh, in chapter 3. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. I think that's a more accurate description of what Jesus said the days of Noah were like. Men, evil continuously, unloving, unholy, despicable. It's possible that my perusal through mainstream media and social media and the internet is just an amplification of the worst of the worst. Or it could be in endemic of what the world actually looks like. And I'm sorry, what, a lot of what I see on the internet is just what Paul describes. So it's not just that um, Israel was born in 1948 on May 16th. It's not just that we're in the generation, but it's that the world, to me, looks like what Jesus and Paul described. Now again, that's just one piece of the puzzle, just one little exegesis of one bit of the prophecy. There's a lot more. But I could be wrong. <laughs> I admit it, 100%. And I have no issue with that. Because I, know, I can guarantee you one thing with 100% confidence. You can take this to the bank. No matter if the tribulation starts next week or in 1,600 years, every single born-again Christian is going to stand face-to-face -face with Jesus. One way or the other, that is going to happen. And I want to take just a minute to give you my idea of what that's going to look like. Because I like it. <laughs> I think it's neat. Um, before I do, though, I, I want to make, I think you know this, but I want to make it crystal clear. I am not a prophet, and I have never been given a special vision by God. <laughs> this is my supposition of what that meeting and what that encounter is going to look like based on my interpretation of Scripture. But again, I still think it's neat. So please bear with me as, as I go through this. But however we get to heaven, whether it be by rapture or by the natural way every other person has up to, to this point, I imagine that you know we blink our eyes and we're standing, and I'll take this from a personal standpoint, a first person, I'm standing in front of this massive coliseum, like what you would see, like an Olympic stadium for the track and field. And it's just more beautiful than anything man has created. Just an amazing, huge stadium and a gate standing wide open. And I'm led to walk through that gate into the center field. And it's completely empty except for two things. In the middle is a throne on which sits Jesus. And I know immediately it's Jesus, the most beautiful person I have ever seen. His face radiating with such light like the sun that I can barely stand to look at him, and yet I can't take my eyes away because he's smiling at me, and he's happy. 
It's just incredible. And as I walk forward, the other thing, I finally do take my eyes off him for a moment and see that in front of the throne is this massive, massive granite table. And sitting in the center of this massive granite table is the most beautiful, ornately carved golden crown I have ever seen in my life. Just gorgeous. And as I get closer to this table, I'm now almost to the table, I'm able to take my eyes off the crown for a minute, even though it's radiating God's glory like nobody's, it's almost glowing, it's just amazing. But I see all around it, arrayed in nice rows, are these gray fist-sized stones just covering the granite table. And as I look at them, you know, a little perplexed, what are gray stones doing among this amazing, beautiful crown? As I look at them, a memory pops into my head. Memory, memory, memory. And all of them are my accomplishments. One of them, you know, the diploma I got, graduated college. Another one, this promotion I got at, jo at a job. You know, things I vividly remember. Um, this other one, honestly didn't even recall it, but it was a memory of me sitting down in a hotel in Manhattan sharing the gospel with a complete stranger. Memory after memory after memory just laid out all in front of me. As I'm standing there looking at all these memories and turning my eyes back to the crown, suddenly the granite table turns a little orange and then erupts into this massive fire. Heat, so intense, I actually unintentionally take a step back. It is intense. I look at the stones and they're starting to change. Some of the stones are starting to crumble, turn into dust. Other of the stones are starting to crumble, but they can geal and they turn into these beautiful, innately carved gems. Rubies, sapphires, diamonds, pearls. Gems I don't even recognize, but scattered throughout the table, you've got ashes and then gems, ashes and gems. Eventually, when all the stones are consumed, the fire dies down, and I feel this wind behind me. And this wind comes rushing in and starts whirling right around the table so fast. I should be blown away, but I'm not. And I look, and all the ashes have all scattered. They're gone. But the stones, the gemstones, are rising up, twirling with the whirlwind, circling the throne. The, th or the crown starts to levitate. It also starts to spin. And one by one, the gemstones come and embed themselves in the crown. Gemstone after gemstone after gemstone until the crown, all the gems are embedded in this crown. The wind dies down and the crown lowers back on the table. I stand there in awe. What was once the most amazing crown I have ever seen is now tenfold as beautiful. The, intricately carved stones radiating the light of Jesus so magnificently that they seem to glow of their own. And each stone that I look at brings a memory of the time I did something that was pleasing to God. At that point, Jesus steps down, steps off the crown, beaming at me so broad, broadly. <laughs> Can barely contain my joy. He, it is obvious he is infinitely proud. He steps forward, grabs the crown, and places it on my head. At that moment, the stadium erupts in applause. I hadn't even noticed that the stands were filled. It is just an overwhelming joy. And at that moment, Jesus leans forward, grabs me gently by the shoulder, and says, Hey, Carl, come check out your mansion. I think you're really going to like this. <laughs> it's not going to be exactly like that, but it's going to be close. I think. And that's something every single one of us is going to experience. Now in this room, I mean, I know you guys. I know you guys have a lot of gemstones getting ready to be embedded in that crown. I will say that I do believe there will be Christians that step up to that table and all of their stones will be burned away and all that will be left will be the golden crown. But, but, there will be no regret, no shame, no, nothing but joy. Jesus will still, is still proud of them. He, that person followed him. He believes. He is there and he got the crown. 
that person will be filled with joy. And as he walks the streets of heaven, sees other crowns ornately ordained, zero jealousy. He's just going, that is one beautiful crown. Check mine out. It's really cool, too. Exactly right to say so. And even if, again, I sincerely doubt it in this room, but even if you're one to have a crown that has no gems, that's perfectly acceptable. No shame whatsoever. That said, if you have the opportunity to add a gemstone, why wouldn't you? (laughs) And that's what I want to finish up with, is while we're still here, however long that is, we have the opportunity to add gems to our crown. And, all right, you can do it by making a list and saying, well, if I, I need to share the gospel six times this week. I need to go to this. I, I definitely need to go to intercessory prayer on Mondays. Oh, the house of prayer on Saturdays. Maybe Roger will let me join the worship team. I, let's, let's make a list and do a check. Don't do that. Please do not do that. God wants us to, to honor him with joy, not out of um, obligation. And I have a relatively simple process, a method that I've adopted and been using for the past seven years to accomplish that. I, I think, it, okay, it's very simple to understand. It's been very difficult to implement, mainly because I'm selfish, but... I'm working on it. It is a work in progress. And I just want to share it with you. And the reality is it's, it's used by the secular world and it comes out of dialectical behavioral therapy. It's really a great way to minimize conflict and reduce, if not completely eliminate, anxiety from your life. And the concept is actually really simple. It's um, circles of control. I should have made graphics, but bear with me here. I, I think I can explain it. Um, basically, just... Picture concentric circles. At the center is yourself. The next circle comprises your immediate family. The circle outside of that is your close friends and your extended family. The circle outside of that are uh, people you're associated with, acquaintances, and then outside of the circle is the general population. And the levels of control are greatest at the center, diminishing as you go out. That's the basic concept. And now I need you to completely eradicate that because it's wrong. The truth is, you do not have any control. Period. (laughs) You have influence, but you do not have control. And really the key here is you don't even have control over yourself. I know for some that may seem amazing. No, I, I control myself. But the reality is, we're comprised of three parts, you know, three, our, our daily life has three aspects going throughout it, our thoughts, our emotions, and our behavior. Trust me, you do not control your thoughts or your emotions. The only thing you have control over is your behavior, your thoughts and your, or your words and your actions. Now, most times as we walk through life, outside events, whether it be from close family, acquaintances, random, whatever, they will trigger thoughts, and those thoughts will trigger emotions. And our natural instinct is to react, to either eliminate, if it's a negative thought and emotion, to eliminate that, or if it's a positive thought or emotion, to react in a way to augment that. Give me more. (laughs) And that is just our natural instinct. And that, honestly, is how most people go through their daily life. Reaction, stimulus, stimulus, reaction, stimulus, reaction. We, We need to stop that. Respond, don't react. You have control over what you say and what you do. And if you take just a moment to think about, okay, this produced this thought, this produced this this emotion, what is the most beneficial word or action that I can take in this circumstance? What is most going to benefit me? 
And a lot of times what that reaction or that response is going to be is going to be beneficial to the person who triggered the initial thought and emotion. Because if they're benefited, they'll reciprocate and your ultimate benefit will be greater. So adopting this model, you're going to basically, over time, learn to respond in ways that are helpful. Your overall life will improve, you'll receive greater benefit, and the net result is you'll have greater influence over the concentric circles, to the point where those particularly closest to you, but even further out, your influence will be so great that you're not going to get any negative triggers. People will automatically know and they want to treat you in a way that's going to trigger a positive response because they love the way you treat them. That's the secular model. I don't like it. <laughs> and I don't like it because it's centered on self. No, I mean, yes, I'm selfish, but when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I sacrificed myself. I follow him. So while I, this is a great model, and I wish everybody in the world would adopt it, because I imagine actually conflict would reduce significantly if everybody did that, behave this way, I don't, I put God at the center and not myself. And the way that I walk through this, and the way I've been walking through this for the past seven years, is when something triggers me, I respond, but the filter I have is, is this action, is this word pleasing to God? Is it pleasing to God? If it's not, I try to find a response, a, an action or a word that is pleasing to God. And if I can't come up with one, sometimes no response is the best response. Everything I do, I'm trying to be pleasing to God. And I fail a lot. <laughs> but it has had a net benefit it's amazing because taking myself out of it, just doing what pleases God, well, you know, he loves me a lot. And he wants what's good for me. So if I do something that's pleasing to him, it's because it benefits me out of the love that he has for me. It also benefits the people around me because he loves them just as much as he loves me. So my words, my actions, that are pleasing to God are pleasing to the people around me in those greater concentric circles. And you know what? Any influence I would have had from a selfish standpoint is magnified tenfold doing it from a godly standpoint. The only, the only question I think that would come from that model is how do you know what pleases God? Very simple. If you don't already know, I'll share. <laughs> Read the Bible. His character is all throughout it. Study, study, study. Get to know him. Get a good study Bible. Get commentaries. Watch YouTube videos. Listen to audiobooks. Get to know the Word. The Holy Spirit will guide you, and you'll get to know him better and better. Don't limit it, though, to just study. There is a second part to this. Pray. Pray as often as you read. And don't just pray. Talk to him. Get to know him. It's a relationship, and he will answer. I mean, if you can't think of anything to say, I have those moments, not often, I actually have a lot to say, but there are times where I'll just go, hey God, I was reading this part in Matthew, can you help explain the parable of the fig tree? This makes no sense to me. And he goes, yeah, it's a parable, you're not supposed to understand. And sometimes that's it. But other times, that still small voice will come through, and I'll hear a very clear word, and it's like, Thank you, God. I know you a little bit better now. Thank you. And next time something happens and I'm tempted to react in a harmful, negative way, I'm going to pause for half a second and try to figure out what would be pleasing to you. I'd like to suggest that you guys give this a try. I found it highly successful. I, again, I'm not very good at it. Hopefully one day I will be. I don't expect I'll ever be perfect at it, but maybe I can get to about 85%. That'd be nice. I'm at about 50 right now. Um, and I'd like to, yeah, I'll do this really quick. 
tempted not to, but I will. Um, I kind of want to make it a challenge. Um, I would say that for myself, one of the reasons I really am into prophecy has, let me back up, that's a good reverb, um, has a lot to do with just the nature of staying motivated for God. You know, if I look at my life, the reality is I'm re reasonably healthy. I have had my brushes with death, but, you know, and I'm very aware of my mor mortality, but I've got, got access to good health care, um, really good health care. I am reasonably healthy. And I, you know, every objective viewpoint, I should last another 30, 35 years, give or take. Um, you know, barring some tragic accident, I, you know, I'll be around for about 30 years, let's call it. Taking everything else off the table about the rapture, et cetera, it would be really, really hard for me to stay motivated on a day-to-day -day basis for 30 years if I have to look at it at 30 years. For me, to keep myself motivated, to get to achieve a long-term goal, I have to set short-term goals. And that's just the way I operate. So. What I've done, knowing the imminency potential, you know, the doctrine of imminency regarding the rapture, is I set dates. I, did, I, I know, it says right here, no one can know the day or the hour, not, not even the angels of heaven, I don't care, I set dates anyway. It keeps me motivated. Um, and I've been doing that since 2017, 84 months, I've probably set about 80 dates. And I have been wrong 80 times, and I've never shared that with anyone because I'm very vain. I do not like to be wrong. Which is why I really wasn't going to share any of this with you guys. But my last date that I had was May 18th. A number of reasons behind that. I thought it was very solid. Um, obviously, it's May 26th. Yeah. So I, I have a new one. Um, based on feast days, um, timing calendars, blah, blah, blah. A lot of reasons for it. I really do think it's a good date. Highly probable, in my humble opinion, that the rapture is going to occur on August 13th, 2024. <laughs> now, if it doesn't, here's, how, here's the payoff. So what I'd like to propose is adopt this model of life until August 13th. Just try your best to live a life, your words and actions that are pleasing to God for just a couple of months. If the rapture happens before August 13th, I need you to track me down in heaven, give me a hard time for getting it wrong, 100%. If, which to, given my history is probably more likely, um, Wednesday, it's a Wednesday, August 14th arrives, and we all wake up and are still here. Um, that following Sunday, track me down in the fellowship hall and give me a hard time for getting it wrong. But after you're done ribbing me, tell me if your life has changed living this model. I think the answer will be in the affirmative. And even if it's not, I guarantee your crowns are going to look amazing. I'd like to invite you to stand as we prepare to worship the Lord and invite the worship team up to lead us in that. And I'd also like to invite you to join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you for the gift of prophecy, the gift of your word, your promises, what you guarantee us as followers of you. I could not be more thankful. I pray that you encourage the hearts of this congregation to live a life that is pleasing to you, that you inspire them to know what is pleasing to you, and to remind them in those really, really difficult times that you've got, your, that you've got their back. You are there for them, and all they need to do is think about you, and you will provide the appropriate answer. Lord, make the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart pleasing in your sight. Oh, Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. In the holy name of your Son, Yeshua HaMashiach, 
Amen.